questions from the mailbag, which means we didn't have anything else to talk about in this segment. So we asked you for ideas for content, but we're transparent about that as well. We're transparent about how we get our ideas and colonoscopies. Teddy, at Matt Yvonne has a question. What is more likely for Panthers for now quarterback Teddy Bridgewater? He remains the Panthers week one starter, backs up Sam Darnold, or starts for a different team at some point during the 2021 season? This one is probably the easiest question we'll get all day. Well, I mean, it, it's it's no, no, and no, really, is what I would say. You know, I mean, okay, maybe starts for a different team at some point during the 2021 season. That's, that's where I would say that's a possibility. But, I mean, I think you and me are in the same camp here. I don't think there's any way he's in Carolina. I, I don't at any as a starter, a backup, whatever that may be, that's gone. It's done with. And then, you know, now it's a different team. And I, I don't look at it as a like, oh, he's going to go to a different team and be a starter unless Seattle maybe did something with Russell Wilson and traded him. That's the only place I look at to just go definitive starter. You know, yeah, I, maybe he gets a chance to fairly compete against Drew Locke and do all that, but I would still think even Drew gets the edge there. So ultimately, I think he's a backup for another team who's just going to wait for his chance to maybe get to play in 2021. Yeah, I think of these options, he's not going to be the week one starter in Carolina. He's not going to back up. They're going to get rid of him because it's 17 million if he's on the week one roster. It's only 10 million now. He will be cut if he's not traded. And I think he will be traded and the Panthers will pay part of the 10 million guaranteed that he's already due to make. I think the most likely is he ends up starting at some point later this year for another team, whether it's Denver or whether it's he becomes that gap quarterback in San Francisco. Dump Garoppolo in the 25 million. Pay Teddy 12 or yeah, so. That's right, right. Let him be the guy until Mac Jones, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, whoever is ready to go at number three. And then you don't have that potential for a Jimmy Garoppolo if he has that assignment to be great and awesome. And then it's impossible to pull him off the field. You want a guy that, even if you're four and one or five and two or whatever the case may be, if you, the other guy's ready, you don't want it to be a huge ruckus yeah, that's when right. you pull right. the starter for the young guy, which uh, far less chance of a ruckus if Teddy Bridgewater's the guy who'd get pulled. No, uh, agreed. You're, you're right. That would have to be the, the, the type of scenario there. So yeah, I think we're on the same page with Teddy B and, and where he goes. All right. Uh, PFTPM Posse has a question as it relates to Deshaun Watson. Hindsight being 2020, should the Texans have taken the best trade offer weeks ago for Deshaun or is holding on to him the better choice overall. This is another easy one. I appreciate it. Yeah, go it. ahead. You easy. do it. These make you us look it. like we're not idiots. Yeah. Uh, of course they should have traded. They should have, they should have dumped him for whatever they could have gotten before we became aware of the first lawsuit, period. And they should have moved on, moved out, taken what they could, and let someone else deal with this mess. The question I have is, because this was percolating from the middle of February onward, would the new team have found out through the exercise of whatever due diligence would have been performed before trading for Deshaun Watson, would they have caught wind yeah, right. of this right. and said, no, nah, we're not going to go forward. Thanks, Texans, but nah, seem too anxious to trade this guy all of a sudden. We did our homework. We're, we're, we're not going to do this. What, what, like, I mean, to me, again, yeah, of course, in hindsight, you know, yeah, they should have traded him and all of that. The only thing you can really look at the Texans right now and just – where you just go, I, you know, why were they being so stubborn? I mean, I think, like, where they messed up, at least in my eyes, is not, like, really fairly evaluating, the, like, the, the temperature and the room there, really, where it's like, you and I know, we knew from a lot of different people that Watson wasn't playing for the Texans. And I understand you don't want to let like players run the team and do all of those things, but they made a number of mistakes along the way too. So that's where I just look at it and go like, w w why did you think you were going to be able to salvage this situation? It had gotten to a point and we knew that it was just, it, it was not salvageable at that point. So that's only where I can really just like say, okay, I, I, that I don't get about the Texans, but yeah, I mean, Again, uh, you know, they were probably doing due diligence on the draft and things like that and, you know, driving up the market, making teams more desperate. I don't know. I don't know what their thought was on that. Or maybe they really thought, like, we're not trading him and we're not going to listen to his demands. Uh, I, I, I don't know. 
I think they were always going to trade him, or at least were going to be willing to trade him. I go back to the Nick Casario comments that were made when they introduced David Culley as the new coach, and I think the answer was hiding in plain sight. They didn't slam the door on it. It was just a question of when they were going to decide to take the phone calls, when they were going to decide yeah. to move toward shopping Deshaun Watson. They were picking the right spot. Maybe it was going to be leading up to the draft. Maybe it would have happened now. They just didn't want to do it then. If they'd have had any reason to know, and this creates some interesting ethical questions, and it leads into our next question from Tacos and Gin. If Deshaun Watson were traded four weeks ago, could the deal have been canceled after these allegations? Great There's question. There's an interesting ethical window here. Yeah. If the Texans caught wind of this and dumped him onto a team that didn't know about it, what recourse, if any, would the new team have had yeah. against the Texans? Now, I believe that the NFL would not have done anything about this. The NFL's attitude is, hey, you're on your own. You do your homework. You've got security people who work for you. You've got ways of finding things out. If the Texans knew something and didn't disclose it, that's they don't have an obligation to disclose the possibility that there may be a lawsuit or 22 of them that what you know they they they, they don't have to say that that right. information is available to anyone they happen to have it you don't i think it, i think the deal would have gone through and the deal would have remained now would it have destroyed the relationship between nick casario david cully and anyone else with the team that that took on deshaun watson not knowing about this absolutely yeah would it have potentially and and here's the thing it's not just whether or not you know someone from the dolphins doesn't like me now it's i've got mortal enemies in brian flores and and uh, chris greer and you know it, it it's a small industry and paths cross all the time and sometimes you need a job you you don't want to go around pissing people off sorry london gratuitously because your career at some point may no, depend that's upon why these that guys are so political so, right yeah so i i think that that uh it would have been very ill-advised for the Texans to have known about it and unloaded Deshaun Watson to a team that didn't know about it. But either way, Chris, I don't think the NFL would have done anything. No, well, and, and then to that point, too, like the one thing that, that does show a little bit is, you know, for all the conspiracies and were the Texans in cahoots with Busby and all of that, like I would think if they had a, any inkling that something like this was going down, going, they would have traded him. They would have been like, I don't know, this guy, well, there might be some, you know, crap that hits the fan here at some point in the next month to half a year, whatever, we'll get rid of them. So that, that to, to me also just within this kind of proves that at least I don't think they had any clue that this was going on with Deshaun Watson's private life. Apparently 50 years ago, Pete Rozelle avoided a trade between the Cowboys and the Patriots. Dwayne Thomas was traded to New England. He refused to report, and Pete Rozelle avoided the trade. Uh, look, I, don't, I just I don't see that happening now. The, 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 I, I don't know what the grounds would be. Oh, the guy didn't show up. I remember when Richard Seymour was traded to the Raiders. If, at, at first, he wasn't going to show up. Well, the Raiders would have had recourse. They, they trade for the guy, and if he doesn't show up, you have recourse under the CBA. Remember when the Broncos traded Jake Plummer to the Buccaneers and he yeah, retired? Yeah. The Buccaneers attacked the signing bonus that they didn't even pay. I they know. ultimately got like $3.5 out of Jake Plummer, right. who they had never paid a cent to because they traded for him and he didn't show up. So I don't think the NFL would do anything about this uh, because all's fair. I think this falls into the bucket of all's fair. And if you're willing, if you're Nick Casario, to make – an enemy for life by knowing something and still going through with the trade with someone who doesn't know it. That's on you. Cause yeah. that is going to stick with you a lot longer than the aftermath of that trade yeah. at user for life. If Deshaun Watson is found guilty in a civil trial, can he be prosecuted at a later date? Yeah. As long as the statute of limitations hasn't run, he, they can go forward with the civil case and prosecutor can monitor it. Prosecutor can decide to pursue charges as long as they're within the statute of limitations. Is that usually right? Usually for criminal charges. Yeah. Usually for criminal charges, the statute is longer than it is for civil charges. Look, this is why every once in a while you'll see somebody who's sued, and when it's time for them to get called to testify, they invoke their Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination because they'd rather lose the civil case than end up being prosecuted because of how they get twisted in knots by the plaintiff's lawyer who cross-examines them in the civil case. That's one of the 
the things that that I, I used as my basis for saying Deshaun Watson needs to settle this case because there's no there's no good outcome to these civil cases if he hasn't been prosecuted. Yeah. Because then when it's time to testify, you got to ask yourself, do I invoke the Fifth Amendment and basically forfeit these lawsuits? Because how are you going to win? How are you going to win? They the Ashley Solis tells her story, and then they call Deshaun Watson. First question, I invoke my right against self-incrimination. He's done. It's, it's done. over. It's over. Just fill out the verdict form at that point. Right. It's over. Just a question of how much money Ashley Solis gets as compensation for her harm. And then if you do answer questions, if you waive your right against self-incrimination and you do get twisted in knots by Tony Busby or someone else who, prosecu- who, who, who cross-examines aggressively, then you got to worry about getting prosecuted. It's, that, that's all the more reason why... They settle, need to settle, find a settle. way yeah. to settle, settle, settle in a way that satisfies the 22 individuals. I'm not saying hush money. I'm not saying make it go away quickly. I'm not saying find a way to make this disappear. I'm saying stand up, take your reckoning, make things right, and do it sooner rather than later. Because at some point you're going to have to do it. You may as well do it now. It's just like colonoscopy. At some point you're going to have to do it. You may as well do it now. Yeah, I I, I hear you, Mike. I got listen. I got nothing to add there. I mean, it, it, I I didn't realize all those specifics there, but it's it's interesting, and again, it proves to your point of why he should settle. At playoff cap, if Deshaun Watson plays again, do you think he'll be able to lead a group of men given the creepiness of the allegations against him? You know, my first thought was I wasn't even going to read that question, but then I thought about Mike Vick. I mean, Mike Vick came back after being involved in dog fighting and and admitting to killing dogs. He admitted to killing dogs that, you know, being pre- involved in. I don't know that he ever admitted to being the one who right. strangled or electrocuted or beat the dogs to death, but he was involved in the group that did, and he admitted to being part of that, and and he came back and he played at a high level. I think if you play at a high level, that's all any of your teammates are going to care about. Whatever the outcome is, whatever happens, it's over, it's done, and we move forward as a team. Whatever team he's on, I think that he'll eventually be accepted if he if he if he accepts his reckoning, whatever it is, makes things right. I think he'll be able to continue with his career once he serves whatever suspension the NFL imposes upon him. He he will. Yeah. Will he be able to? Yes, to a degree. I mean, yeah, there's going to be certain guys in the locker room or in the huddle that they're really not going to care. They're just going to go, man, he's good. All I view him is for what I've seen and met him and they'll be able to kind of, you know, again, Swipe it under the rug that way, but you know it. It's not like you 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 said it right. A lot of these guys too. I mean, th- there'll be guys in the in the huddle. I was on teams where offensive linemen and things like that. They might have looked at a receiver who was a pain in the like. Oh man, I effing hate that guy. I can't stand him. That jerk and all these type of things. But it didn't affect their play. You know, again, it just, hey, I'm going to do my job and it'll work in the bigger picture of the team and all of that. So you don't have to love every guy on your team and be like that, you know, to make it work. Hey, he's certainly going to have to prove himself to people and people are going to be looking at him in the side eye going like, what kind of guy is this? Yeah, he's going to have a lot of that and, until, you know, if he does get that opportunity to play again to where, yeah, he got some good years and, and people get to know him a little bit better and maybe he could prove, you know, that he's turned the corner of this weird phase of his life with, with this massage stuff. Ultimately, if you're a great player, these other things are going to fade, especially if the individuals in the locker room believe that you did what you had to do to make things right and you move forward. That's right. I, 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 think, That's I, right. I think if he if he handles this all the right way, Whenever he's able to play again, whenever that may be, it should be a non-issue, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. Next question from at Slaying Eagles. Since Jalen Hurts has the starting quarterback job for this year in Philadelphia, what would you say is a good season for him, Christopher? Well, I, I think just like, you know, of course winning some football games, but not like having to win football games to where we think they're in the playoff hunt. I wouldn't look at that as like, oh, gosh, he has to do that to continue to be the starter. I don't think that's realistic. I think we could bring in a lot of great quarterbacks into Philadelphia. I could tell you they're, I don't think they're going to get in the playoff hunt. So I think what you'd want to see from Jalen Hurst is, again, hey, his ability to make plays, do those things, you know, continue to grow within offense, learning different things, all of that as a leader. And then ultimately the biggest thing, as we all know, is just continue to be more of a polished passer that way. You know, yes, there was some really impressive throws, and he threw the ball better than I expected him to be able to. Uh, I will say that. But, 
you know, still there, there's some parts in some games where you go that that's not up to par. Like I always go back to that Dallas game because there was, there was some throws and decisions in that one that are like, whoa, is that a bad throw? And whoa, is that a bad decision and all those things? So I think that's what it is. Just the continued direction in the right path, show us flashes you're growing as a passer and continue to be that playmaker you are on the run and with deep passes down the field. And then he might have an opportunity to, to solidify himself as a starter there in Philadelphia. Yeah, look, I think this is about stabilizing. After what happened last year, yeah. steady hand, productive, win games, stats don't matter. It is getting the offense to perform, running the offense, executing it the way that it needs to be executed, Yes, getting the team in position where they're at least in the conversation to potentially win the division. That's a successful year. They don't have to win the division. They just have to stabilize. They have to bottom out. You know, this is a team that's just been going down, 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 down. This year, it's successful if you get flattening and a little bit of a dip forward. To right. me, that's, that's what right. he needs that's to do, right. Chris. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Exactly right. That, that kind of said it. You said it the right way. And – you know, we know we saw he, he's got some charisma about him. I love the way he answers questions in the press. You know, he is all about his business. And, you know, even when he was asked about Carson Wentz, he just was, hey, that's not my business. I'm just, you know, going to play football and do that. You know, I, he's got all of those right intangibles. It's it's continued growth in what you're saying. And really the biggest thing is just, you know, the 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 continued ability. Can he progress dicing people up in the pocket with his right arm? The next question comes from a Twitter handle that sounds somewhat vaguely familiar to me, at NFL Shireen. I'm not quite sure who that may be. The Cowboys passed on a defensive player to take C.D. Lamb in 2020. If tight end Kyle Pitts is there at number 10, do they pass on a defensive player again to take him? This question comes amid reports, and obviously it comes from our own Shireen Williams, that Jerry Jones has fallen in love with Kyle Pitts. Of course, he was in love with Johnny Manziel seven years ago. Right. Others in the organization restrained him from drafting Thank Johnny God. Manziel. But right. what do you think if Pitts is there at 10? Assuming he's there at 10, which may be a big assumption, what do you think the Cowboys do? No, no. Negative ghost rider. Like, the pattern is full. We got enough weapons in the pass game. You got a decent tight end as is. Like, that that part of your team is pretty kind of elite. Like, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I just I would not agree with that move. That defense was sucky ducky last year. What do you want to say? I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of issues across the board. They need a difference maker on the defensive side of the ball. You know, again, yeah, I would go pass rusher. You know, Quiddy Pay, Quiddy Paye. I'm not sure about his last name, P A Y E. I don't know if I'm saying it is Pay. Right. Okay. Good. I, he he would be the one that sitting there at ten. You know, gosh, take him. Get him off the edge in that Dan Quinn defense. That'll be special. Or if the kid, you know, Jalen Phillips from Miami's there, that would be, you know, or a corner. You know, Mike, here, here's one of the really intriguing things about the draft, it's, uh, at least in my eyes. And, I, you know, listen, I hear Dar Danielle Jeremiah. I think he, he would probably agree with this a little bit too. I always pay attention to some of the things he says because he's spot on. But, like, when you look at the draft and you look at the players, there's not a lot of, like, superstar high-end players in this draft. It's not as, you know, big time as past drafts. I would argue that really, of out, take the quarterbacks out, that two of the five best players in the draft, Caleb Farley, Virginia Tech, Jalen Phillips, who to me is the best pass rusher in the draft and a physical freak, they have medical things, right? Like, Caleb Farley, Farley is, is one of the best corners I've ever seen coming out of college and evaluated. He just had back surgery. You know, the Jalen Phillips is – he reminds me of JPP or Julius Peppers and one of those type of guys coming off the edge. And he's got the concussion issue and retired from football for a year because of that. That, to me, is also just – I'm sorry to take us off task here a little bit, but just a very intriguing aspect of this kind of weird draft with the quarterbacks in the top ten and everything like that, you know, to add all along with this. You make a great point, and one of the problems this year, because there wasn't a scouting combine, no centralized opportunity to get medical information, and some of that stuff hard to come by, agents – not necessarily willing to be as forthcoming as they would need to be because they want to get their guy drafted as high as possible, and then the team can worry about the medical issues later. But that is part of the problem here, and that, beyond the issues of 
Some teams didn't play much football. Some guys didn't play at all. No scouting combine, on-field workouts. The value of the scouting combine is the medical, and they don't have that Man. this year to the extent that they normally do. That is a problem. At least last year they had that because we had the combine before the world turned upside down. So that's going to make a lot of this crapshoot uh, something that will cause teams to yeah. say a word it's, other it's than crazy. crap before right. it's right. all said and done. Right. Uh, another question, and uh, these have been very good. We thank everyone out there who have uh, contributed. Kellen Mond. This is from Jim Balboni. Chris mentioned Kellen Mond of the Patriots or Steelers on his podcast. Do I agree that this is realistic? Well, Ooh, I, I like I've been this. listening to Chris, so I agree it's real. I think it's realistic. I, I think that Kellen Mond has been the guy who's overlooked. All the talk is Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Mac Jones. You never hear about Kellen Mond. You've got him at number four. You've got him ahead of Lance and Fields. Yeah. All it takes is one team to feel that way. And this guy's a, a top, not top 10, but top 20 pick. I, I look at him rounder. like that. I look at him like that. Certainly, I do. I think he's a first round quarterback. I don't even. I don't I mean. And again, I can line him up against a other a lot of other quarterbacks over the last five, ten years, and go, what? Like, what did you see in that guy's film? And you thought he was a first rounder, and then you watch this guy's film, and you don't think he's a first rounder? I don't understand that. I don't. You know, decision making, great. Like elite arm, elite. Elite in all aspects. It really is. I will go back to what I said from the start. I His only issue is I wish he would just relax with the ball a little bit and scramble a little bit more. That's an easy fix. That's an easy fix. His issues are way easier to fix to me than Trey Lance, who hasn't really even played a lot of football and I think has a somewhat of a, a question in or a hitch in his throwing motion. And the same with Justin Fields to where I would just go, man, Kellen Mond, it's it's kind of a clean slate. You know, that's where I, I, I just you, – you can mold this guy to be a really, you know, special pocket passer, and he's going to be able to make big-time plays with his legs here. You know, I, I'm just – I'm shocked by it. It's been three years of really good play at a school where he hasn't had big-end talent around him, and he dices up SEC defenses weekly. And last year was phenomenal. I, I just don't get it. That's the crazy thing to me about the draft sometimes, just how some guys get hype and other guys don't in certain years in the same year, all that. It just uh, it, it annoys me sometimes. Yeah, and look, I agree with you. I, uh, I And he's going to be a very intriguing prospect, especially the more of a run that there is on quarterbacks at the top, it's going to elevate. That That's the one thing you want to see. If you're an agent who represents – a quarterback. You want quarterbacks to be drafted yeah. quickly, quickly, quickly. Receiver, yeah. you want go, go, go. Get them off the board because then my guy pumps up the list of the best remaining players at the position. And even though teams say they're going to take the best available player regardless of position, their needs influence which way they go when they evaluate the best available. So the closer your guy is to the top of the remaining at his position, the better chance he has of getting drafted. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.